one that, here and, too long. That's you, so yeah. Yeah. that's two of us. That's two of us. Yeah. That's your shim thirty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Thanks for giving yeah, me that. Yes. No, I moved it on.
You didn't have a PhD. <laughs> You're taking notes on the paragraph. Good, we an admission right there. Thank you. Come on in. There, there's seats down front if you if you want to. And for the people in the overflow room, there are a couple seats in the auditorium if you'd like to move into here. So uh, thank you all for coming. I have a, a brief announcement at the beginning: is uh, we have uh, sign language interpreters handy. Uh, if you if you would like a sign language interpreter, please raise your hand, and we'll make sure they're up here. If not, we'll we'll release them for the day. So none that I see. So I, I think you're you're free to stay and watch the lecture if you like, or or go as you see fit. Um, for, so for those of you who've been here before. Uh, you know, I've, I've told you that uh, this is one of uh, two, of the, or there's two departments of the Carnegie Institution for Science on this campus, uh, but the Carnegie Institution runs research departments across the United States in six different places, uh, three in California and uh, three on the East Coast. Uh, today's speaker is actually from one of our East Coast uh, departments, uh, the Department of Embryology, which is up on the John Hopkins campus. And we have the honor today of, of, of being able to hear from Dr. Yushin Zhang, who is the director of that department. Uh, Yushen has done a, a wide variety of work in uh, the field of biology, particularly in looking at cell development. Uh, this is kind of the, the background history of that department, uh, but looking at basically the biochemistry that allows cell, cells to grow uh, and age. She started a very interesting project on uh, coral, which you'll hear a lot about today. So Dr. Zhang got her uh, PhD at uh, Ohio State University and then a postdoc at the University of California, San Francisco. She joined the Carnegie Institution in 1996. Uh, and been there uh, since then, but in 2016, she became, huh, 16, she became director, uh, it's, you know, it seems like longer, but <laughs> a director of the uh, Department of Embryology up there. So it's a great honor to me. I've, I've had the privilege of being able to work with her. Uh, this is one of the, the good points about being a director of this place is seeing all of the interesting science that goes on across the institution. So I've had the pleasure of, of hearing a lot uh, from you, Shen, and I hope you enjoy your presentation tonight, too, on uh, the Biology of Corals Research in Environmental Health. Well, it's really a great honor to uh, come here and give a public lecture. I've heard it. I've heard This is a little bouncy. The, the sound. The sound is a little bouncy. All right. I really enjoyed the public lecture here which one I attended. So actually, the first slide I'm showing here is our building. It's actually pretty new. It was, we moved in 2005, and it's just a beautiful building. Um, this is where, where my department is on Hopkins campus. Um, all right, so what I want to do today is to kind of tell you more of a overview of biology, how biology uh, how progress is made in biology and how, where the frontiers might be and where, as Carnegie scientists, where we're moving to. So um, to understand biology, really, a lot of progress is made by using these different organisms, which biologists call model organisms. And the reason we use these model organisms is because they grow fast, they are easier to cultivate, and you can, you can actually manipulate them. So, the, this is one thing I want to uh, introduce to you. Model organism is absolutely essential in biology. And because of the using of model, or, and the reason you can use model organisms to understand biology is because these model organisms actually evolved, they share evolutionary history. So something you understand here, for example, in Baker's, Baker's East about how the yeast cell go from one to become two, in fact, works in vertebrates like zebrafish or mammals, in mouse or in us. The, the principles are actually highly conserved. That's why model organism approach work very well. And so as in plants, you understand this Eropdopsis, which is a mustard plant, uh, how it works to do photosynthesis, how it grow, also applies to the crop plants, okay? So the study of model organisms has, has really made amazing uh, progress and discoveries of all the biological principles we've learned re really come from largely of the model organism studies. And we have discovered genes, and 
biologists have this, uh, developed methods in order to study genes functions. And in doing so, we have begun to understand, we already now understand how one cell egg can develop into a fully functional organism. We understand how, for example, plants perform photosynthesis. We also have really begin, begun to be able to understand and treat certain diseases and also why we age and how aging is associated with a lot of diseases. And I want to give you a brief example about can, cancer immunotherapy. How many of you have heard of cancer immunotherapy? Good. You probably went to the um, Carnegie Lecture on, on cancer immunotherapy. So this work came about because of the model organism studies in mouse or in Drosophila, in understanding how humans fight uh, invas uh, microbe invasions and, and immune system. Okay, so um, what I want to do is to highlight some of the tools that's been developed by um, studying model organisms. The tools that's developed in the 80s that has been really extremely uh, instrumental in understanding biology in the organism is the use of uh, what we call mobile DNA. Uh, and then you, by using mobile DNA, uh, the first genetically modified animal called fruit fly has been created. So this tool has made a lot of contributions. I'll come back to that a little bit in, on the next slide. The second thing that's really a huge step forward for biologists is to uh, the discovery of RNA interference that allowed uh, biologists to be able to manipulate genes in a different way. And this is, this is much more broadly applicable. This has been ap applied mostly in fly, whereas the, the manipulation of genes with this RNAi method can be applied in different or organisms. And then more recently, many of you must have heard CRISPR now. This is very exciting. It, this is completely based on base, basic research. Now you have precision to be able to manipulate genes by changing a base pair at a time or changing much, many, much longer stretches of DNA. And also another thing I want to mention is this amazing technology of DNA sequencing. It, it, the technology was already there decades ago, but now we have this what's called high throughput sequencing. It, it's now enabling us to understand our genes, understand how they are being leveraged to do things at a much higher uh, depth of um, understanding as well as resolution. And I will. I will come talk about that, mention that later. Okay, so, um, you know, as Carnegie scientists, uh, it's, I think, to kind of tell you guys about where we're going, it's important to tell you guys about where we used to be and what, what we have been through in the last 100 years. Uh, Carnegie biologists in the last 100 years really has been developing tools, developing, uh, creating model organisms to study the vast complexity of biology within individual organisms, just like what you have seen in my first slide, trying to understand how individual organisms work, how different genes work in different processes in biology. And this has been extremely successful. Uh, for example, the DNA as genetic material was actually discovered by a Carnegie biologist, uh, Alfred Hershey. He won Nobel Prize in 1969. And uh, the mobile DNA or jumping genes that I just shown you is this, was discovered by Barbara McClintock, who won Nobel Prize in 1983 for her discovery. And this was made, this discovery was made in, in her studying of corn shown here, whereas DNA study was done in bacteria. Um, so following up with this uh, mobile DNA discovery, uh, scientists at Carnegie, which is in embryology department, in my department, by, uh, by the name of Sprat Spratling and uh, Rubin, have been able to use the mobile DNA that, that's found in Drosophila to actually transform Drosophila by introducing genes into Drosophila and changing its phenotype of the Drosophila. And then the RNAi I mentioned actually was discovered by using model organism called nematodes. And this was discovered also in, in the department I came from, uh, embryology department of Carnegie. This was done by 
Andy Fire, who was in our department uh, when he made the discovery, and somebody else, Craig Mello from uh, Mass uh, UMass. So, um, so these are the Nobel Prize winning discoveries, but this actually, this uh, discovery and uh, this creation of the tool to transform Drosophila actually has directly contributed to four Nobel Prizes out of the six total Nobel Prizes that's given to the, Drosoph the discoveries made in Drosophila. So it's really amazing history of, of biology and of our department. Um, but, you know, we can't always sit on our laurels. We have to always search for the frontier, and really that's what Carnegie is about. We need to set the, set the trend instead of following the trend. And when, when you already finish set, setting the trend, you ought to think about, okay, when there are already enough people doing it, maybe your contribution has diminished. Maybe you need to find something new to do that will lead to bigger impact. So anyway, uh, kind of give, to give you a, a sum up of what I and me and my colleagues are thinking is in biology, you can actually see it as the classical biological field versus the post-gene and genome field. Um, in the classical field where genetics or uh, development or evolution or ecology, the science is mostly based on observational. You observe and document and you describe. Whereas once um, biologists learned how learned all their genes and we can manipulate the genes, that really revolutionized the way we study genetics, study development, and also study evolution. Now, one area in ecology, I mean, the area in ecology, no, though, is still kind of largely based on observational and description and documentation, which is important. We need to continue to do that. But we felt it's actually time to, actually, to start to understand the genes that, that is functioning in, part, in the organism that led to the ecosystem development. So that's what we call the genes and the ecosystem. And indeed, you know, if you think about biology, you think about organisms, we never really live alone. We live in our environment, and we have, we have this amazing interactions between different or, among different organisms, and you know, that's how we end up evolving into this beautiful ecosystem, uh, such as the coral reef, such as the uh, forests. So, in addition, the, so the study of the ecosystem really is the, is the study of ecology. That's what we call ecology. And the ecosystem around us really is incredibly important. And what you think about a good ecosystem, really the way you define it is that it can produce biomass. Uh, it is resilient to perturbation. If you have temporary perturbations of uh, temperature change, it is able to actually not change because it's well buffered. And it is biologically very diverse, meaning that it has all kinds of species that's interacting with one another and you know, keeping this steady state. And it can support species to evolve. If you have a good, good ecosystem, the species are able to adapt if you have perturbations. And then they will also accommodate and support human activity. So then if you think about this various levels of ecosystem, really it's all built from the individual interactions, right? You have different species interact with one another, and then they kind of combine together to form this network, the community. And then they, so this would be the community level of ecosystem. And then they further, uh, their further interaction and feedbacks led to more global level of ecosystem. Like you, when you think about global, in my view, it's like you are looking at the whole Lake, several lakes that are in the neighborhood, how, how that system is changing and responding. Uh, whereas you look at the local ecosystem is what I, in my view, is considered as field ecology. You are looking at certain narrower areas that you, you look at its change. Uh, what I, when we think about our genes and the ecosystem is really staying at this level. We hope to understand the genes that governs the interactions between species as well as the genes that governs the interaction between the species and the physical abiotic uh, world. 
And those are the genes, actually, we know they are not discovered yet. Because you know, most of the time in the last several decades, what biologists are doing is to look for genes. When you don't have it, you are having a huge disruption. So basically, the organism can't even live or live very poorly. Uh, and as a result, many organisms we have studied, we really only found about, you know, depending on the organism, maybe half of the gene or only 25% of those genes have what we call a function. The rest of them don't have a function. And it's obvious they are there for a reason. And the reason they don't have the function is because we keep them in, the completely, in a complete isolation. They are not in the real ecosystem. So that's why you don't see their function being revealed. But we believe when, once you put them in this uh, more com complex system that, where they are interacting with the environment, and you design assays differently, you'll reveal those remaining genes functions. So that's, what, that's the way we call our, we define our genes and ecosystems as our new initiative. Uh, so the, um, sorry, the unmet, needs for, uh, for this ecosystem studies, in, in our view, is really the gene level of study, how genes functions in this kind of interactions. Whereas the field ecology and global ecology are already pretty vibrant field. And they largely don't consider, don't, they are not concerned about the mechanism of how the systems work at the gene level. So we felt that's a, an unmet need. Okay, so um, as we're going, as I'm going along with the ecosystem, and I would like to kind of also remind you, in fact, humans, ourselves, each individual is our own ecosystem. We have bacteria, we live with bacteria, both on the surface of our body and also on different cavities. And most important cavity in our body that the ecosystem is really important for our health is really our gut. Our gut has all kinds of bacteria, And I, I just mentioned to you about the cancer immuno, immunotherapy. I don't know how many of you caught what Dr. Hangzhou had said, that in fact, what his lab had discovered is that the success of immunotherapy is depending on the gut microbiome. He's made that discovery in his lab. So definitely, this is a very critical ecosystem. But it's very difficult to study, because in our gut, we have at least 1,000 different bacteria species. That does not include other microbes that are not bacteria. There are uh, archaea I will show you later. Um, so in addition to that, there are individual differences. The person next to you have different combinations of these bacteria species. So it's incredibly difficult to put them together to understand what's going on, why, why the gut health is so important to your whole body health, how the gut cells is communicating with different parts of our body, different cells in our body. And recently, you, I even read about the influence of gut to our brain function. So how does that work? And clearly, this complicated system is not amenable to discover base, basic principles. So what um, I will do today is to actually talk to you about symbiosis and endosymbiosis. I will first highlight to you about the gut bacteria interaction study we're doing in our department using Drosophila as a model. So the second thing I will talk about is coral algae interaction in the form we call endosymbiosis. Don't worry, I'll explain what's symbiosis and endosymbiosis. Uh, so our, our biologists definitely, at Carnegie alone, would definitely be very good at working out the interactions between plants and various uh, uh, other organisms in the soil. That's actually very important in crop production as well. Okay, so as I said, um, you know, gut, so symbiosis. What's symbiosis? Sem is together, biosis is life. So basically, the sense of the, this word is dis, describing the uh, living together of organisms that the organisms are able to benefit with one another. And in this sense, the organism doesn't have to live inside the cell of another organism. It can live in the cavity. So in, the, in this case, it really is in the gut. 
But as I already just told you, that it's too complicated to understand that symbiosis uh, using mouse or using human or mouse because it's too too many different species and the cell type is too complicated. But in Drosophila, it's really quite a bit simpler. There are six different bacteria living in fly gut, and they in different flies they have similar six different kind of bacteria living in there, and also. Another huge advantage is all of this bacteria can be cultured. Many bacteria in the human gut cannot be cultured, so you can manipulate them. Whereas here, all these six different bacteria can be grown and can be manipulated, meaning you can change its gene and see what's happening of, to this bacteria in terms of its ability to live in the gut. And you also have all kinds of tools in, in, in Drosophila that allows you to tell, okay, what's, what's wrong if I don't have this gene? Which gene is regulating what interaction? And also, how is that interaction leading to the communication of gut to other parts of the body? So this actually is the effort led by a wonderful graduate student, Hao Lang Zhu, shown here, and two faculty at Carnegie. One is Will Loddington, the other one is Alan Spratley. I told you about Alan's contribution in biology. And then Will is our young faculty. So what they're, they're trying to do is which gut cells, they want to know, this is a part of what they are trying to do that's relevant by, to my talk. They want to know which gut cells interact and support which bacteria species. They also want to know which gut cells can absorb which kind of nutrients that is a result of having this symbiotic relationship with which bacteria. And finally, they want to know which of these cells are communicating with their, with their other cells in the body through this, as a result of this symbiotic relationship. Okay, so I'm gonna have to give you this slide because I don't really know how much biology my audience know. Um, I'm going to give you this introduction before I'm going to tell you a little bit more of science. So in this, basically, here I'm showing you a eukaryotic cell. It, the essence of eukaryotic cell is it has a nucleus where uh, the cell uses to ha house its DNA. And then it has a cytoplasm. The function is separated, but there you can transport things in and out of the nucleus. And this is the cytoplasm. This is the whole cell. So what I need to kind of introduce you is the following, very simple. Basically, for, for our body to function, we have different cells. And the cells are not all the same. I mean, we have heart cells that's different from our lung cells. And the reason they're not the same is because they have the same DNA, but they are not the same. That's because the DNA is actually making different RNA. So you can just think about this, okay, DNA makes RNA, and then RNA will get into the cytoplasm, and they make different types of RNA in different cells. And so if you, you share the similar kind of RNA, then you are similar cell type, okay? So then the RNA is made into protein, and oftentimes it's the protein that's doing the job in our body. Okay, so with that, then I will be able to tell you more. Um, so the question really is, it's actually surprising. We don't even know if, if there is an eco niche for bacteria colonization, meaning that if you, um, it, is there a specific place in your gut that bacteria will always go there and stay there? We don't know that. So um, here it shows you the Drosophila gut. It's very simple. It has a hind gut is close to the anus, and then mid gut is a lot of activities going on, digestion and stuff. Fore gut is kind of like our stomach. Um, so the, it's, in order to find out whether there's a place, niche, for the, bac, for the bacteria in the gut, you can't really just look at the well-fed bacteria, uh, the well-fed uh, fly, because when we have food, the, gut in our, the, the bacteria in our gut will just keep dividing. So essentially, you see it filled with bacteria. So you can use this setting to find whether you have this eco niche for, for bacteria. So what Will did is to starve the bacteria, uh, to starve the gut, uh, to starve the flies, and see what, what's remaining in the gut. 
what he's found is actually the major area that you have uh, bacteria is this, uh, this area. So this probably, for this particular bacteria, this is the niche for, for, the, for the bacteria to colonize. So you, when, you just can't wash it out. It, it stays there. It stays there. There are some interactions there. Okay, so if you cut a section, that's why I have the dash line here. So if you cut a section across here and look at this cross section of the gut, you can see this bacteria that's really in this very nicely structured area. That's where the bacteria likes to stay and make that interaction. So this suggests there is a, what we call, what Will calls the eco niche in the gut. So the next question, well, then the, what, what could you get, what are the additional evidence you can generate for the possibility that there are actual genes that's controlling this interaction? So there is a pretty well-known gene called MUC68D. It, the name doesn't matter. What is known about this gene is they live in the mucus areas. They live in the mucus of the, they, they're expressed in the mucosal cells in the gut. So what Will had done is to remove this gene from the Drosophila. So this is the region enlarged here. When he, this is the, this is the wild type, meaning the gene is intact. And when he removes this gene from the fly, you can see the bacteria is greatly diminished. So that's another evidence showing that, yes, there is an eco niche. And yes, there might be, there might be genes that actually regulate, uh, basically help the gut to hang on to specific bacteria. So now they learned this. The next thing they want to really know is to discover cells and their genes in the gut got eco niche so they can begin to put together what kind of cell structure you have there that will allow them to hang on to the uh, bacteria and that will also begin the process of understanding which are the cells that is interacting with the gut which are uh, with the bacteria which are the cells that might be functioning to communicating absorbing and communicating with with the endings of neurons so the technique here really is what this student, uh, Hao Lang Zhu, did is to dissect a lot of this region of the gut. It's a full gut region. And dissociate this um, region into individual cells. And then use this machine. It's called, um, we, it's a 10x genomics. So this machine is actually quite cool. You feed cells from one port, and then you you shoot streams in with beads from another port, and then once it meets, once the bead and the cell met together, you form a drop. And so inside the drop, you have the bead, you have a cell. And then these beads, each bead are barcoded. It has a marker for that specific cell. So then once you process, once the bio, then in this drop, the cells are broken open, and all the RNA I told you that's made by the DNA, will be then processed for sequencing. Because you barcoded each individual cells, then you can mix them together and do your sequencing. Then you can read the barcode to say, oh, these are the genes belong to one cell, these are genes belong to another cell. So this gives you this, uh, what we call high throughput capacity to know which cell are similar to the other cell. So this is actually the map of that experiment what they found is there are five different cell types as colored by, as colored here. These are different uh, cell types, and this is purely based on their similarity in gene expression. So this is the exp this is a way you can visualize the genes, similar genes. Each yellow dot is a gene that's highly expressed. So these cells basically share gene expression. These are different cells because they share different gene expression. That's how you group them into different cell types. And what's really interesting is in this work, they found, okay, three out of five cell types express this mucin gene, muc 60 ad And this is basically showing it differently to show this heat map of high expression of this gene in uh, three cell types here and low expression in the other two cell types here. So this basically is showing you the beginning of an area where you can actually understand the cells that's making the interaction, 
and you know their genes, then you can manip manipulate their genes. And that's how you can break open an area where you can start to learn the principles of, of this ecosystem. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about coral. Um, this is a coral. Now, why is it called endosymbiosis? Well, um, the reason they're called endosymbiosis need a little bit of an introduction. So I want to uh, give you a brief introduction of how we come about, how eukaryotes come about. I think you all know bacteria. You know eukaryotes. Where are eukaryotes? I just told you eukaryotes have cells that the DNA is, is inside an organelle called nucleus that's surrounded by membrane, where prokaryotes, basically, the DNA is naked. The DNA and the cytoplasm, the, the, the other materials are all together in a sac, whereas in uh, eukaryotes, you have nucleus, and that's us. Um, and then in between uh, bacteria and, you, uh, and eukaryotes, you have arche archaea, and we don't have to worry about that tonight. Uh, so what is endosymbiosis? Actually, a lot of evolutionary studies have um, converged onto this very reasonable idea. You, you can't demonstrate this, but it's a very reasonable idea that eukaryotes come about with two independently living, possibly bacteria, with one bacteria engulf the other one, the other one, and then they become one, they live together like this. This is, and then because they form a mutually beneficial relationship, it's called symbiosis. The reason it's endo is because one Organi organ organism is in another, and they can divide together, they basically live as one. And this actually is what we believe that led to the evolution of an organelle, very famous organelle called mitochondria. How many of you heard of mitochondria? Good. <laughs> so mitochondria produce energy. So if we don't have mitochondria, we won't be here. Uh, we, we need our energy to get around. Um, and then another endosymbiotic event led to the development of chloroplast. That's the organelle that does photosynthesis. So that's also the reason we end up having green plants. So, all of, so endosymbiosis is actually a very important evolutionary uh, phenomena that led to continuous evolution of different uh, organisms we see today. OK, so corals. Um, before I tell you what's endosymbiosis in corals, I have to tell you that corals are animals, but they live like plants. So here shows you three different kinds of corals. This is a soft coral. Uh, this, these two are hard corals, and they have these polyps. And here, soft coral tend to have large polyps, whereas hard corals tend to have tiny polyps. As you can see here, they're very small um, here. And this one is so small, I mean, I didn't take a higher, higher um, magnification image. They, this coral's polyps are very small. OK, how can they live as a plant? Well, it's because they do endosymbiosis. The way they do it is the following. So basically, here is a cross-section of a coral. And some of the corals, when we say hot corals, are those corals that they can actually secrete calcium carbonate to build skeleton outside of them, exoskeleton. And then when you cut a cross section, you can see their little feet are inside the uh, calcium car carbonate. And then uh, here is actually their stomach area. And corals are a lot simpler than us. They only have two layers, the, uh, what's called endoderm layer and the ectoderm layer. And the endoderm layer is where they actually can do endosymbiosis, so this is blown up. Some of the cells in this gut of coral can actually swallow up algae. So these are algae, green algae. These are, this algae, this family of algae is actually also called, either called symbiodinium for those that forms this endosymbiotic, endosymbiotic relationship with coral, or dinoflagellates. Dinoflagellates is referring to a much larger family. And a lot of um, algae bloom, the bad things that's happening to our lakes and oceans, are actually caused by dinoflagellates. OK, so 
these kind of some cells in, in this gut of coral can take up algae, and once they get in, instead of being digested and degraded, they get into this membrane sac called symbiosome. And inside the symbiosome, you have all kinds of receptors there. And the corals, this algae is able to take advantage of nutrients of the coral cells offer, and then you know, allowing this algae to do photosynthesis inside the cell. And then other um, receptors or pumps on this membrane is allowing the um, algae to share its fixed carbon, like sugar, or some uh, certain lipids with the host. So this is the reason that corals actually can live in a very pristine water, because they really don't need much nutrients. They are deriving a lot of its nutrients from its algae through photosynthesis like a plant. Yet they are animal. They actually do move. I'll show you. Uh, they actually do move. All right. Coral is actually very important for the world. Um, they are, first of all, there are about over 2,500 coral species. Uh, quite a lot of them, about slightly, somewhat less than half of them, are reef building coral species. Reef building are those called hard corals. They secrete calcium carbonate. So they can build this connected uh, exoskeleton and forming our reefs such as this. And they are only actually taking up about 0.1 or 0.2 percent of the ocean's uh, area. The surface, you, if you calculate the surface cover of the ocean, it's very tiny. Yet they can support 25 percent of marine species on Earth. And they are really considered on, on par with rainforests in terms of its biodiversity. They are area, they, they provide re, uh, the, the niche for many fish to raise their young, to lay eggs and raise their young. So um, they are very important source of food, of course, because you need the corals to have, to be able to allow fish to come in and uh, reproduce. And they are important um, storm surge breakers and of course, Tourism, I'm sure in this audience, many of you at least have gone snorkeling once and saw beautiful corals. Okay, so the, but the problem with corals is that they are actually fairly prone for bleaching death and that then leads to uh, reef destruction. So here it really shows you a very nice and beautiful coral. And these, as you can see, they have tiny polyps. And the reason they have this color is because inside them there are algae that provides this color. And when the color goes away, when, this, when um, corals lose their algae, they become white. That's why coral bleaching, what, that's why we call it coral bleaching, because it really does look like bleaching. And because when they don't have um, algae and they already have adapted the environment of very new nutrients, they really can't survive with time, you'll, they'll die. And when corals die, of course, you will end up with massive reef death. And that indeed is happening around the world. Here just shows you uh, the, um, so I, I think I forgot to tell you, this is the map to world corals. Every dot is a, world, uh, is a site of coral. And then here, show, sorry, what did I do? Oh, here. So um, here shows you, um, I, I couldn't superimpose on this, but it just basically shows you uh, there are a lot of areas that has very high bleaching. This is in 1990 to, and 2000. So every summer when the weather increases, when, when the temperature increases, you, if it increases for a per, uh, um, prolonged time, you will end up with coral bleaching. And, uh, temperature is actually not the only stress. Um, the runoffs from our, you know, our land, and that ended up increasing the nutrients. That's stressful corals as well because they are used to living in nu low nutrients water. Um, also, the storm storms when you have massive storms, you will break up the reefs. That also leads to destruction. So right now, essentially, it's multiple stress that combine to make this crisis. So this bleaching event, uh, if you only have bleaching like every five to 10 years, 
you are actually going to be able to recover quite a bit of coral growth again. But now the problem is we have really bleaching events very frequently, like every two or three years. So that's actually becoming a very large problem. So this is the reason we think it's important to understand its biology with the hope that we might be able to do something about it. If we are able to cure human disease, the hope is that we probably would be able to do something with corals. OK, so in order to understand corals' basic biology, you have to have a system where you can actually control it. You can study it in the reef because the weather changes all the time. You just don't have control over it. But if you create a reef in the laboratory as this, you, can, you have a much better control. So here I'm going to show you one model that we are studying. I think I can just. OK, so this is, a, this is actually the coral that we are studying. This is called the Zinnia. This is a new model we are building. And you can see here, you know, you have, I, this is a full ecosystem. We have fish, we have snails, we have various kinds of stuff in there. And this is a blow up, blown up of that behaving coral. They actually pulse. It's also called pulsing Zinnia. It's soft coral, but they do the same thing in terms of taking up algae. They also can do uh, calcification. And because we are able to do it in a laboratory setting, we can also uh, look at its behavior that was never reported. So basically, this is a sped up uh, uh, live imaging of uh, this coral uh, for like two days or so. And here, basically, it's night. The lights are out. You can see this pinkish light. The, the color is gone. This is evening. You can see the polyps actually shrunk back in periodically throughout the night. And during the day, they never do that. So during the day, when we image them many times, it just, they just keep pulsing. So that actually is the first time we realize, oh, OK, maybe they do sleep. We, you know, we've, I've never read about coral sleeping. So, so this is the effort, actually. It's led by a postdoctoral fellow, Min Ji Hu, and it's collaboration between my lab and Simin Fan's lab. So, uh, because very little is known about corals other than the observation of, you know, you have two layers of cells. So the inside layer uh, functions as a gut, and the outside layer has other functions. But we don't really know what cell is what. So what we did, the first thing we did, obviously, is to assemble the genome. We have to know what genes are there. And that's where high throughput sequencing becomes very powerful. And the second thing we did, once we assembled the genome, then we want to define the cell type in Zinnia coral. So we did similar things, as I said, by dissociating these uh, uh, corals into individual cells, passed them through this uh, strategy of sequencing the genes in individual cells and clustering them, figuring out which cell, which, what groups of cells express similar genes. So we found actually, right now we can actually group them into 13 different cell types. OK, that's really great. We actually know the gene. We know what the, are the genes defining different cell types? There are certain different types. And of course, when, the t when we do more and higher throughput, we might find additional minor, additional differences even within this, each different cell type. But at this moment, this is what we found. Now, I told you about endosymbiosis. What we really want to know is how, which cell, which of these 13 cell types actually work, live with corals? I live with algae. Well, to do that, what we did is to actually take the advantage of the algae living inside the coral cells actually have autofluorescence. So we can actually separate the non-algae containing cor uh, coral cells away from the algae containing coral cells. And then we can do sequencing. We can just put, subject this group of cells and that group of cells to RNA sequencing to know what's, what genes, what RNA is in there. And then after doing that, what we did is to compare. So basically, this is algae-containing cell RNA expression. This is two different replicates. This is algae-free cells, two different replicates. And then you can take these cells and compare these um, genes, compare with each of these cell types as they're 13 and then 12. And what we found very strikingly is that cell type 13 is most similar to algae-containing cells. None of these others are that similar 
So this is how we figured out, oh, this is the algae content itself. Of course, we did more experiment to show that yes, we've identified, we've defined the algae containing cell type, and we know what kind of gene it's expressed. What's also extremely satisfying is when we look at some of these genes, it's really striking that um, they are, of course, very highly expressed in this cell type 13, and some of them actually is already telling me what these genes might be. You know, the study of biology, because of the conservation, because of the evolutionary conservation, we've learned a lot about different proteins' functions. So here I'm just showing you some examples of these genes we found to be specifically uh, in existing in this, I mean, expressed in this cell type, is that this three actually is starting to tell us, okay, well, even though they are, their whole thing is not identical to other uh, proteins in other organisms, but they have this, what we call domains, that indicates function. So these domains really is telling us, oh, okay, we've discovered receptors, meaning the, the, the proteins that's on the cell surface that could recognize another uh, entity, organism or particle. So, and we, so actually it's this four. We also discovered other uh, proteins here the domain, conserved domain, is teaching, is telling us, okay, these are likely to be doing, uh, to be man managing when the, when, when you, how do you take up this algae, and when they come in, how do you make them live in this, um, in this membrane sac called symbiosome? And also we found uh, in blue, all of these proteins are actually receptor, the, the, the um, things, the channels on the uh, symbiosome membrane, I told you that they, help to share the nutrients from the coral and the, uh, and the algae. So it's just really quite uh, satisfying. You just do this, you found all of these genes. Um, here, oops, sorry, I keep doing the wrong button. Okay, so here is again just to show you that, for example, this gene is so highly expressed in the cell type 13, whereas the other gene here is expressed in all the cell types. They are related genes. They are related genes, should have related functions, but this one really have specific functions, most likely involved because this cell type has to do this uh, endosymbiosis, whereas the other cell types don't, and this other gene probably is used for the other functions of this pathway. Okay, so um, now after discovering genes, you also need to kind of build ways to analyze the gene function to really understand further understand how these cells come about and, you know, throughout their biological process. So the, an, another assay that was developed by, um, by Mingji was to really try to work out zinnia regeneration. So in fact, corals are actually quite re, regenerative. This, this, this whole species, this, this, this kind of species, when you cut them, they actually can grow back. For example, you can cut this polyp, the tentacles away, and you know, by eight days, they already come back with these tentacles. And you can also take the one tentacle, put it on a tissue culture dish, and you just wait. It takes longer, about 20 days, you start to see, oh, they're starting to grow back their tentacles. So basically, you have this regression. The, the tentacle actually becomes stock, and then they will grow back the other seven of the tentacles, and the other one will regress, and then wait until everybody comes back, then it starts to grow. So this is a really amazing regenerative system. So with this regenerative system, what we learned is actually this whole process of regeneration requires new algae uptake and it requires photosynthesis. So this gives us a assay to look at, okay, if I don't have this gene, what happens? Do you do the regeneration or what part of it is affected? And with this system, we also did more uh, analysis of genes um, using this kind of um, approach I told you about understanding individual cells. And what we are able to see is actually when you look at just cell type 13, you can, you, you can sort them into different states. There are four states here, and this state is most likely pre-algae state and likely stem cell progenitor state. And then these cells that make a transition go through this transition state. This red actually is just gene expression, different genes that's being expressed in these cell types. 
Uh, and then, you know, the blue is low expression. So you can see the grouping shows that this group of cells express this group of genes at high level. And then as you go through a state two, different genes are starting to turn on. And the gene that's strong here is starting to be turned off. And this is very likely a mature algae-containing uh, cells. And they definitely don't, they turn off these genes and turn on this group of genes. And this, uh, this uh, state, as we call it state four, we think it's probably involved in bleaching because there are a lot of stress signatures, the genes that's involved in stress response are being expressed at a fairly high level. And they don't express this very important genes marking the mature algae-containing cells. Um, so we, we suspect, in fact, I mean, knowing biology, you know, you don't ever have a cell live forever. So even for this algae-containing cells, they go through their developmental trajectory. They start with a progenitor cell. They take up algae. They do their job to, do for, to, to extract nutrients from, from algae. And then they'll get old. When they get old, they might expel algae. They might die. Uh, they might just dissociate from our gut. In fact, in our gut, we are constantly sloughing off the gut cells and the stem cells in the gut constantly replenish those cells. So the coral bleaching could potentially be studied from a more, as a, from a perspective of that's actually a normal process. And when you have stress, you basically accentuate this process. You end up with a lot more cells that don't stay in this uh, mature state and then die off because stress definitely causes aging and causes disease. So this, this actually is an indication that we can definitely study uh, normal biology to understand why corals are bleaching. Okay, so obviously I've told you genes. We've, we are able to define genes. We have a lot of great candidates to start to understand normal biology, but if you can't manipulate these genes, then you are still no better than the classical study of biology, observational and documentation. So in order to manipulate genes, we have to develop ways to do that, and one thing I'm very pleased to report is we're now fairly confident we can actually, using this technique I described to you, RNAi, discovered in my department, to knock, to down-regulate genes, so these are different genes, that uh, three different genes we've treated with RNAi, and these are the controls. So you just look at the, the gene expression level control compared to the control. So we're actually doing a good job at down-regulating these genes. This really offer, offers great hope that we'll be able to begin to manipulate these genes to understand biology of coral bleaching. Um, obviously, all of this we do is with the hope that one day we could really do something about the coral reefs. And I, this is actually a fairly hot topic about resilient corals. This resilient corals actually do exist in nature. People have observed them. You can see uh, two colonies of coral. One is under the same, so very similar environment. One will go, undergo bleaching, the other one is fine. So why? What's, what's driving that? So, you know, while we really want to use laboratory studies to understand normal coral biology, we also would like to work with field ecologists. And we do have, I'd list one collaborator, uh, Pete Edmund. He actually has three sites. Here I'm showing two sites, Maria and St. John Islands here. Um, so if we are able to bring the technology to the field to actually study those corals that are resilient, then we might be able to learn something that would connect to what we are discovering with the field and then slowly being able to make progress in kind of thinking about how we might be able to actually cultivate more resilient corals. This would be something that a biologist could contribute. Obviously, policy needs to be made in order to really change the, um, change the behavior of, of what we are having and to really save our environment. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm not sure how long I have been talking. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes.
you for the uh, great presentation. Uh, now that <clears throat> you have the technology uh, with RNA interference and with CRISPR, that you can nip genes with CRISPR and add uh, deletions, etc. Uh, do you feel that there might be an implication not only for the resilience that you are emphasizing in order to save the corals, but uh, any pharmaceutical applications in medicine, in that's clinical a, application? Yeah, that's a really great point. I didn't make, I thought maybe it will come from the audience. So uh, human beings really have tapped to quite a bit of pharmaceutical potential terrestrially. Um, the marine world has really not been tapped very much. Uh, so there, there's a huge reserve there. It's really important, even for that purpose alone, to preserve our marine ecology e ecosystem. And there are actually currently about four, uh, marine, four chemicals coming from the marine world that's being ac actually at a fairly advanced stage to treat cancer. Um, I think most of them are derived from jellyfish, which actually belongs to the similar phyla, phylum of corals, um, jellyfish. I mean, this whole phylum is called Nideria. Yes, that's a really good question. It's, it's untapped, it's not a, it's a heavily tapped area. So you said you figured out the genome of the Xenia. Yes. How many genes does the Xenia have? 20, about 27,000. Yeah, it's pretty complex. Uh, it, it complex as a as an organism goes. Any more questions? Uh, you, you say the corals. Sorry. The, the corals um, really uh, survive in a very low nutrient right. environment. Right. Uh, what happens in a high nutrient? They actually get stressed out. They will start to expel their algae, and they have all kinds of diseases. Because when you are in a high nutrient field oh, uh, uh, environment, not only the corals are under stress, you also have bacteria and other organisms in that water that start to proliferate. So you end up with really very stressful conditions. I was so impressed with your ability to recreate the uh, the environment um, overall for uh, for the corals, and I wonder if you can comment a little bit off topic on the uh, ability for for others to do similarly, particularly in the context of arc projects, trying to uh, salvage what uh, what we can retain of uh, different uh, diverse species of corals. Yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, so. Actually, uh, before corals were under stress and was really in this state, uh, people, we have a lot of hobbyists who are just really into corals because they are really beautiful. I mean, our coral facility, whenever I'm stressed out or I'm just tired, I go downstairs, I go watch the corals, and I come out really feel good. So there's a really huge um, industry that's supporting hobbyists. And in fact, the person who helps us once a week to take care of our corals, he owns a shop. We went to his shop to get the corals. Yes, you can actually really do it. Um, it, it I mean, the manuscript we're actually uh, revising, and one of the reviewer's question is, you need to document how you do this so other people could do it. Yes, I, I think it's really very doable. Uh, we actually calculated the amount of money cost to maintain coral. Uh, reef we have in the laboratory versus zebrafish. Many, I don't know, some of you probably know zebrafish is, a, I, I showed you, the very good model organism. We are actually cheaper than zebrafish. The reason is because zebrafish swims around. If you, you have to keep them in individual tanks, corals stay there. So we can keep them all together. Well, when we start to have genetically engineered ones, we'll have to separate them. But we know where they are. They don't swim. Yeah. is actually bleaching the ocean besides like the known things and uh, why don't we um, do like what they do in China they have um, in the rivers where they have salamanders they buy a distiller like a, a big industrial distiller and they, they could um, 
fix the water to the exact um, ecology and the temperature that it's supposed to be instead of putting hot water they can make it cold certain times of year yeah. why don't we do that in these different places yeah so that's actually an effort called the eco engineering uh, it it is very vast uh, area you have to do it so I mean, there are people talking about it, but how much money it's going to cost, I think it's going to be a huge amount of money. There are also talks about maybe you can just have an umbrella, big umbrella over the reef area when, when it's very hot. Maybe that will drop the temperature. Yeah, that's called the eco-engineering. Yeah. Uh, I, I read something recently about uh, exploration of plastics in the water and some of the dissolving aspects of that might be harming corals. Can you give us any information on that? Um, so I'm not sure plastics are the major cause for the corals problem, but plastics is definitely a major problem for fish. And again, it's an ecosystem, right? The fish, fish actually, you know, the reason we put fish in our uh, coral reef in the laboratory is the coral needs the poo from the fish to provide this so-called dissolved organic uh, nutrients. So if you are hurting the fish, you definitely are going to hurt the corals and other, you know, associated species. Yes. There were very few blue dots on your world map. Yes. Um, could you identify where they are and especially why they're blue? I mean, um, why are they I think this surviving? will have to be a question from a field ecologist. My sense about this is that probably uh, there are the areas that's bleaching tended to be bleached again. Those probably are the areas you have fairly sensitive corals. And this picture tells us that most of our corals are pretty sensitive to bleaching. And the areas that's not bleached are probably the areas that has very um, resistant corals. And it would be, like I said, I have not really went back to see if you have an area that's consistently not being bleached as frequently. I think those would be very interesting area to do some biology in. That's why we do need to work with field ecologists to figure that out. I, I'm not keeping track on this. Anything else? Has anyone tried transplanting the resistant uh, corals into an area that was occupied by non-resistant corals that bleached out to see if the resistant corals can survive <clears throat> in an area, or is it something to do with the areas where they are that's helping them be resistant? Um, so based on the observations, at least for some resistant corals, it's really just in the same area. Some are bleached, some are not, and they apparently are the same species. Uh, with regard to your first question of have people been trying to transplant uh, resistant corals, so yes, people are trying to do that. And you know, even in the Fro Florida Keys, I mean, we used to have beautiful corals called staghorn corals. They are like very pointy uh, corals. They are really near being wiped out, but um, people are trying to plant this citizen type of effort to try to plant additional corals in the Keys. It's, yeah, it is the effort people are making. But you, know, you, you need to have them surviving. And I don't think there are so, such a huge stock of resistant corals to allow you to do massive transplanting. So that, that could be a limitation. Okay, I think we'll call it an evening there. So let's thank you, Shen, again. Thank you.